There's one other thing we can do. I'm just going to kind of advertise this slightly. Um, and that's that there, there, there are new techniques in molecular biology which are called metagenomics. That's, that just means sequence everything. And now, our ability to sequence genes is so good that we can basically um, identify a new pathogen within hours or even days or even hours of its first appearing. I'll give you one quick case study. I'm sure you know in the US of, in the last few years, a disease that's really wiping out bee populations called colony collapse disorder. So the bees kind of disappear from the hive and presume to have died. It's a very mysterious thing. Now, of course, if the bees go, we are in serious trouble. There's no pollination. It's a massive, massive public health problem. So what's the cause of this disease, this, this disease of bees? Well, we, now, with modern, modern day um, genomics, we have new ways we can actually try and find the cause of, 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 of this disease. So what, we, what we can do, and I was involved in this work, is that, and it's a slightly technical picture, but it doesn't matter. So what you do is you, you go to hives that have no disease, and hives where the, where the bees are suffering the disease, and you sequence every piece of DNA in that hive. You sequence the bee, you sequence the, the, the honey, everything. And then you see what's different between the, the, the hives that are ill and the hives that are normal. So you see a massive, massive sequencing, incredible amount, which you could never do two or three years ago. And if you do that, you find that all the diseased hives differ in one way only from the, the hives that are, that, are, that, are, that are healthy. And that's the diseased hives have a virus called IAPV. It sounds like Israeli acute paralysis virus. It's got nothing to do with Israel whatsoever. This is kind of uh, an accident of history. But it's one virus characterizes all the diseased hives. And that's the most likely cause of this disease, of this, this, this very, very serious disease of bees. So now, I'm very hopeful with this kind of modern sequencing, which is incredibly powerful now, that we can actually find the cause of new, of new viral infections within hours of, of, of disease being um, identified. So I've, I've, to help you, to, as I thought the thing to do here is I, I've got some questions I thought you might want to kind of discuss with me or amongst yourselves. And I must say, not all these, in fact, I think none of them, I know the answer to myself. So I'm actually looking for answers, okay? So I'm not here to kind of teach. I don't know myself. So here they are. One, why do most emerging viruses burn out before causing a, a big pandemic? So that list I gave you a little while ago, most of those diseases have not become human pathogens. They cause a few infections and they burn out. Ebola, I'm sure you've all heard of, very serious infection from Central Africa. Ebola is a great example of a kind of burnout virus. It, it, it comes to the forest, kills a number of people, and then fades away. Why does that happen? Why do very few get going, become human bugs, real human pathogens, but most kind of fade away? Second, are some animal species better reservoirs for human viruses than others, okay? So I told you, HIV comes from chimpanzees and other monkeys. Flu, flu is actually from, from water birds. Are some species better able to carry bugs that then jump into us better than others? And finally, the kind of key question, the one that everyone wants to know is, what's going to come next? Okay, what's the next big viral disease of humans going to be? So we've had H1N1 very recently. We had SARS-4, that was now. Can we, can we predict what will emerge next in population? That's the, that is the absolute key thing that many people are trying to work out. I'll be very happy to have any guidance on how we do that. And finally, I've got a kind of special bonus question. What happened to H1N1? Okay, so six months ago, we were running to our senators and, and, and screaming we wanted a vaccination. Now it appears to have completely kind of died away. So why is that? And I've, I've done quite a lot of work on this virus. So if we're interested in influenza, it's a very good example of emerging virus that's come from the species. I'm more than happy to, have, to talk about H1N1 and will it come back and where is it now? I think I'll stop there. So. I have a microphone here. I guess we'll start with the table that is closest. Uh, mention what question you discussed and what your answer was. Uh, we thought about all the questions. Okay. Um, and we had a variety of answers. Um, we, we were least certain on what will emerge next. What we think might have happened to H1N1 is that it mutated its way into being too deadly and sort of faded out of the population. Um, and we thought maybe that some animal species that are similar to humans would probably better, be better reservoirs for future viruses, but we also weren't sure if we were talking about host or um, uh, something like a mosquito, which would just transmit it. Mm -hmm. Those were some of the things we were thinking about. Yeah, and, and so the idea... So 
your statement was that animals that look like humans may, may be good hosts for human pathogens. And that's actually a, a good answer. So for a virus to get into a human cell, any, any cell, it needs to kind of unlock the, the key of the cell. And this, our cells and all cells have receptors that on, on the surface of the cell that, that viruses enter. And the more similar the species are, the more similar their receptors are, these kind of locks and key things are. And so humans and chimpanzees, our cells are very similar, our receptors are very similar, and so it's a good entry point for viruses to get in. The problem, though, is that we don't tend to expose ourselves as often to species that are like us. So we, on a daily basis, how many chimpanzees do you encounter? Right? It's probably not that many, okay? But living, in, living in, in cities in the US, you would encounter lots of rodents and birds and bats and like that. And although their cells are more different, it's harder for the virus to get in. Because we're exposed more, there's more chance of actually getting something. So it's a kind of balance between being hosts that look like us, so the virus can work easy, but being exposed to them. In, in Africa, what's happened now, of course, with the logging industry, is we've, we've exposed ourselves much more to chimpanzees and, and, and other primates that, that look like us and carry viruses like us and other diseases like us. And that's what's changed. So HIV, for example, is absolutely caused by logging in West Africa. So logging in West Africa over the last 20th century, we encroach more and more into the forest, exposed, you know, encountered wild primates and got their viruses. So it's a good answer. All right, another table over here. Well, we talked mainly about the third one, so the can we predict viral emergence. And so we were talking about the similarities that we mostly pay attention to a new virus that shows up in humans because that's the thing we care about. But what you were talking about with the bees, it's yeah. the same kind of yeah. thing from their point of view. A new virus shows up yeah. in their population. And um, wondering if it would be possible, as you kind of, I think, hinted at, that you could just kind of constantly sample the air or something and yeah. just see what's out there, or if what might happen is you just wind up getting lots of false positive stuff that wouldn't have infected us and we freak yeah. out over all sorts of other things. So one thing that people are doing now, and you made a very good point, is that there's a global effort now to sample viruses in, and other pathogens in every community you can imagine. So you go to seawater, many people have done this now, you go in seawater, a very small amount of seawater carries an enormous number of viruses. Okay, incredible number. People are using freshwater lakes, they're using different human tissue samples, even fecal samples. You find viruses there, they're all over the place. The key question is, as, as you mentioned, is how do we know they're going to cause a disease in humans. That's, that's the difficult thing. So we can survey these things, and there's lots there, but which one of this massive biodiversity is, will become a disease in humans? And that's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, there are probably more viruses than anything else, okay? Almost certainly. Most of the biggest mass of DNA and RNA on the planet is, is, are viruses. So it's massive diversity. Only a very small number will ever, ever cause these in humans. And finding those ones is very hard to do. Uh, can get those viruses through the fish, yes? So, okay, so going back to the earlier question, um, the closer our species are, the more likely the virus will work in those species. So, if you eat plant, we all eat plant food, okay? You all go to the, your, your, your supermarket and you buy lettuce and whatever. I will guarantee you that's, that has viruses in, in that food, okay? You eat, plant, you eat plant viruses every day of your life. You're probably eating it now in your salads, but don't worry. It adds flavor. No one has ever yet got a disease from a plant virus because they don't replicate in human cells because they're so divergent. So we're exposed to things, fish, for example. I don't know yet of any, any virus from a fish that, that, it, that will infect human cells. We, we almost certainly eat them. We almost certainly do. But they don't work in human cells. So you have to be much closer than, than, than fish. Are obviously, a long way from humans and kind of evolutionary trees. So you need to be a much closer species for that to work. But they will have them in them, but they won't work in our cells. <laughs>